Hi, so today is another episode of The Corner Booth. It's going to be episode 18. And this time around, we're going to be talking about Tex Avery, who is hands down my favorite shorts director. Hi, my name is Luis Escobar. I'm a storyboard artist in The Simpsons television show. I've been working on the show for over 25 years now. And I'm here to empower you. So uh, this conversation, uh, the, the way that I'm releasing these Corner Booth episodes are completely and totally out of order. They're not in order in any way. So at the beginning of the episode when you hear me, when you hear Larry and I talk about having lost an episode, it was our first attempt at recording the Top 10 Disney Movies uh, podcast. And we just kind of lost that recording. I actually have... I just found the recording of the first five minutes, the, the five-minute conversation we had before we lost the episode. This episode happens very early on, before all the interviews that I've uh, already published. So definitely out of order. So this is a little bit off the cuff. We were outside of my studio we all kind of we kind of met outside of my studio and we just decided to have a conversation so there's a lot of ambient noise people walking behind us people pushing chairs around things like that it doesn't really bother too much but um just to let you know that that's that happens and that's what's going on that's why that sound in that uh, is there so without any further ado here we go in the conversation where we start off with Larry making me laugh, and uh, we just kind of go off from there. Hey, this is straight man Larry Whitaker here. <laughs> and funny man. Uh, you want to go ahead and enter? Luis Escobar. And here we are at <laughs> the, the corner, corner booth. booth. <laughs> Without chance. Yeah, no chance today of a corner booth with any chance of having <laughs> chance. <clears throat> chance. <laughs> so Luis informed me that our last episode, which I won't go into the title of, was only uh, successful in recording five minutes. <laughs> so we're going to re-record that one at a later time when chance can be with us. Yeah, because that was a good episode. Too bad we... <sighs> so you'll just have to wait. I have to do it again. But it was exciting. So <laughs> Luis has come up with a plethora... <laughs> have I? ...of ideas for Corner Booth episodes in addition to some interviews we'll be doing in the future. So today, what are we talking about, Luis? What are we talking about, Luis? I have no idea. <laughs> this is going to be a very short episode. Yeah, uh, I had a list of... <laughs> Incredible, <laughs> mind-bending no, subjects. No, no, the, the only one, the only one that sticks to my mind is the is the controversial one. <laughs> they, Are know, we gonna have to put a, like want... an age, uh, <laughs> a, 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 an age uh, no, uh, warning no, on this the, thing? Because uh, <laughs> so let's let's try a lighthearted one, and then maybe if, if we get enough reaction from people, we'll. we'll we want to do lighthearted. So we're going to talk about supernatural vampire hunter D movies is that <laughs> with lots of blood and gore. We could talk. We could talk about horror and supernatural, but oh. if we are, it, it, it kind of. I mean, Chance, who's also all into that that stuff. Well, he's, he's not here. Why would no, that's his fault? Let's, let's <laughs> talk about a little something. <laughs> let's talk about the the creator of uh, Bugs Bunny. <laughs> you mean Chuck Jones? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, some of you have probably heard on the radio the Chuck Jones experience, which I think was like in Vegas or something, I don't, some I don't casino, know, I don't know saying he was the creator of Bugs I, Bunny. He was I, not, <laughs> although he certainly was a huge part of the development of Bugs. He was the creator of Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner, but who did create Bugs Bunny? Tex Avery. I've heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> Highly influential cartoonist who went from Warner Brothers to 
MGM. I think it is craziest stuff by far at MGM. Well, yeah, I, I've got. Um, I'm such a huge fan. I mean, he he's the reason why I. He's the reason why I got into animation. Like I have to say that that's he's 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 the reason because um, I saw a documentary that the, the uh, Tex Avery documentary. Have you ever seen that? I don't know if I have. I I've got bits of it or clips of it from online on my site. I don't. I think it's. If you search on my site, say type in Tex Avery, you're going to see what it. What website? Uh, LuisEscobarBlog.com. If you go on the search, just type in Tex Avery, and that particular post should come up. But uh, it it opened my eyes to um, to animation that wasn't just for kids, and at least it it explained to the mass audience that this guy wasn't necessarily doing kid cartoons he was just drawing doing cartoons that made him laugh and it, in, in the in the target audience was like adult teenagers and, and up I, it seems to me I remember I may be getting the quote wrong but I recall a quote that was supposedly from Walt Disney I'd have to check my source but it uh, was something to the effect of uh, Walt was responding to someone's question of how he came up with uh, uh, animated uh, ideas for animated cartoons and uh, why is it that uh, the cartoons he makes for kids are so successful and he said well I don't make cartoons for kids I make cartoons for everybody and I think that if you have that kind of a mindset when you're when you're obviously you've got to target certain certain venues have to be targeted the Simpsons is not targeted toward little kids obviously and and uh, many of the Lo old Looney Tunes were not. They were an all audiences kind of thing. Everybody was, you know, watching those cartoons. But um, if you have that kind of a mindset, you cast a much broader net when you're entertaining people. And kids are a lot smarter than people think. You know, yeah, you may write something that some of the some of the material is above the kid's head. They may not get it. But that's what's so great when you get older and you watch it again. You feel <laughs> smart because suddenly, hey, I get that. I get that gag now. Yeah, he um, he apparently lost an eye due to a paperclip fight in the studio. <laughs> he actually had only Tex one Avery eye. Did, yeah. It's crazy. Well, tell tell us about him. I mean, I I know a little bit about him, but some of the listeners aren't going to know who he is. Well, Tex Avery. Well, he invented Bugs Bunny, but he but the I mean, well, among many others, Creepy it, Dog also. Um, and it, and and it wasn't. He didn't invent um, Elmer, did he? I can't remember. Maybe he created. Did he create Egghead, which evolved into yes. Elmer? Yeah. Um, he screwy squirrel, droopy. Um, he he invented the the animated take. Before the him, wild animated yeah, take, the yeah. wild animated take, the ones where the eyeballs bug out and all that other stuff. He invented that. That before him, that that wasn't that wasn't part of uh, the lexicon of animation, um, which I think is, is absolutely fascinating. He also. Invented well, like the the in in a lot of ways he was kind of like the person who invented um, Jessica Rabbit because because of Red because of Red Riding Hood yeah he invented the 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 the, the sexy cartoon girl that that was actually just there to be sexy <laughs> and the guys were just like. Gog gawking over her and and reacting to her and that and then suddenly so like, you're talking about Red Hot Riding Hood and, Hot and Riding other Hood. cartoons and other that cartoons were... that had featured the same character with the wolf yeah that also reacted to and 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 so that's the stuff that he did that was a little bit more um, it's a little it's a lot less kid friendly <laughs> that was not a kitty thing and. Um, and I wasn't really aware of that. And I'm like, there's car there's there's shorts like this. Like I, I, I was a teenager when I watched that documentary, and I'm like, that's awesome. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's it, it's hilarious because of the reactions of the characters is so extreme, and and you know you want to do the same thing when you see a pretty girl. You're like, oh, and you want to like drop your the tongue right. rolls off. Well, put it this way: with, with, without a, without Tex Avery. What would that have done to modern cartoons? It would have been a very different world because Tex Avery cartoons were not like Disney cartoons. Right. Very different. The acting in Disney cartoons, although there were there are examples that go very extreme, nothing as consistently and as extreme on a regular basis 
as Tex Avery stuff. Right. Very, very broad, very cartoony, very uh, surreal and, animation. And, and very, very violent. Like, yeah. he, his stuff, his is the, the fall, characters falling, anvils falling on your head gags. That's, he's the one that really started that and took it to the extreme. Well, you know, I'll tell you, Ray, Ray Patterson was a, was a good friend of mine, and Ray uh, started out at, I think, gosh, I think it was Minx Studi- Min- Studios, I think. I'd have to look look up my notes. But, but Ray uh, was at Disney, okay. and then he went on to, uh, shortly after the first few Tom and Jerry cartoons, he went to MGM and was uh, a part of the original... Uh, Tom and Jerry unit for years and mm-hmm. years mm-hmm. and there came a point he told me when he was there that you had the Tex Avery crew doing yeah. the droopy dog cartoons and, right. the, and the wolf and uh, red cartoons and then you had the Tom and Jerry unit and as Tex Avery got more and more wild uh, the Tom and Jerry unit said well we're not going to stand for that and they started to get more and more wild right. so the competition was between the two crews who could do the wildest stuff and so as Tom and Jerry got more wild it, that was because it was directly affected by the crew doing the droopy dog cartoons and all the Tex Avery, right? Uh, all the Tex Avery wild takes and you know wild stuff. So you you saw that af- affect how Tom and Jerry became more and more and more broad. You look at the first Tom and Jerry cartoons, the first couple, and they're pretty traditional. Disney could have put those out. They're not that extreme. Right. But then you had things where, you know, Tom would be sliced into bits and you right, know, yep. he'd mm-hmm. be run he'd be running across the lawn and he and he'd he'd run through some kind of a I don't know, like a, a uh, a saw blade or something, and or a fence. He, yeah, or a fence, and and he'd end up falling apart as he ran across the lawn, and his head would be on one end of the lawn, and his tail would be on the opposite end of the lawn. That kind of stuff happened because of the Tex Avery unit. Yeah, according, yeah. According to Ray. Yeah. Well, no, and it, and, and it's uh, actually the the documentary says exactly that yeah. that that uh, it affected. But the it's a documentary. You can talk to the people that actually were there, Louise. <laughs> well, yeah, but. But that's what I'm saying. That, well, the documentary actually talked to the people who were there that were interviewing them, and actually, that's what they said. Yeah, um, that that it was the competition within the MGM uh, studio. Now, you know something else that Ray told me is that uh, the guys over at Warner Brothers would sneak out their shorts, and the guys at MGM would sneak out their shorts, and they'd meet at a theater. I think they said in Burbank, and they would show off each other's work to each other. <laughs> And That's one awesome. year, one year it became a big controversy. Do you remember when Bugs Bunny was playing the piano and a mouse was in the piano? Yeah. I forgot what cartoon it is. No, you know what? I made that. I've seen that one. It, it, that, and then there was one where, where Tom is playing, I think, at the Hollywood Bowl, I think, at playing a piano concerto, and, and Jerry's in, asleep in the piano. Well, I believe it was... T- you have to correct me, listeners. Please blog us and or... or write us and let us know uh, but I believe that won the Oscar for that year but they both came out the same year and the cartoons were almost exactly the same wow and I think if I recall properly that Ray said they got in trouble because they figured someone saw this cartoon over at Warner Brothers or we saw this cartoon you know that Warner Brothers were working on personally I think it was the, the Tom and Jerry one was the original because the mouse and the cat right you know there was there was no little little mouse uh, that was partnered with Bugs Bunny before. Yeah, of course. But uh, I, but one of them, I believe it was the Tom and Jerry one, won the Oscar that year. So I guess that made, made a big stink. Wow. The off topic, but back to Tom. Back to. Uh, <laughs> back well, that's to, a, it's back a, to Tex a, Avery. It's a very interesting tangent, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but he 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 created characters like like Screwy Squirrel, which um, not very visible now, but. Great. Screwy crazy. Squirrel wasn't exactly yeah. that appealing. It yep. was a pretty. I liked the Screwy Squirrel cartoons. They had, uh, well, the thing is, I, I mean, he was more of a grading. I don't even necessarily mean the, the drawings of him, but he was more of a great, more of a grading <laughs> like character. That? Yeah, like, like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, no, I. I don't know. I liked. I liked those cartoons. I, I mean, I, I. I became obsessed with Tex Avery. Um, after the documentary, and then, like I said, he influenced me coming into the animation industry because after that, um, the documentary, I realized that uh, it, it actually I wanted to be Tex Avery. Uh, I wanted to do 
what Tex Avery did. I wanted to be a director, writer that created funny cartoons. That was like my goal, and that's why I came and get, got into the animation industry. Um, so te Tex started. Where did he? Do you remember where he started at? The first studio he worked at? No, I don't. I don't remember. But then he came into his own at Warner Brothers. Yes. And then went to MGM. Yes. And then from there went to Walter Lance, I think. Yes. Because he did Chili Willy cartoons. Because he did Chili Willy and Quickie Koala after mm -hmm. that, and then um, uh, Raid commercials. Yeah. Raid? Raid. <laughs> <laughs> Raid! Um, but, yeah, so... But he, uh, oh, man, it... it so I, I ended up getting, um, back in the VHS days, I still have my VHS tapes. Uh, what? And, and they have, uh, I have three volumes of all just, just uh, Tex Avery shorts. And I watched them all, and I just, they're just so good. They're so good. But you know what, what, what's, the, what's the whipped cream or the icing on the cake of those cartoons, in my opinion? What? Scott Bradley. Uh, Would it bother you guys if I smoke right over here? I'm sorry? Would it bother you guys if I smoke a cigarette right no, no. Okay. No, go ahead. We'll just edit that out. <laughs> the what? Scott Bradley. You've never heard of him? Because you've certainly heard his music. Oh. <laughs> I like, I mean, I, as much as I like the Looney Tunes uh, scores, Mm-hmm. I personally, um, and Scott Bradley did all of the, the Tom and Jerry cartoons as well. I personally like Scott Bradley's the best. He blended a lot of jazz in with his uh, with his music. And the the timing, the great timing that Tex Avery did was accented by that music and the way that the way that it was composed. And I don't know if you've ever been in a session where where uh, the composer's been doing the music to the picture. Mm. I think I mentioned this before. I was uh, in on an episode when we were doing Tiny Tunes, and um, Bruce Broughton was was uh, the composer, and he was he had the whole orchestra there, and we were watching the picture, and he was doing the final music to picture. Okay. So he would sit there and watch what was going on, then he would direct the orchestra to hit the beats right at the action points. Oh, great! Which is exactly oh, right, the right. same kind of thing that Scott Bradley did. It made all the difference. I think there was actually there's a YouTube concert <clears throat> of. Of Chuck Jones shorts, box office bunny is what you're yeah. talking about. That's yeah, it's and they, done the and same way. Yeah, they did. They did that. Just the the, mm -hmm. they or, the whole orchestra is just doing the live music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the um, sound effects. Right. Yeah, <laughs> live sound effects. <laughs> yeah, it's really great to watch that. So it's kind of like that, only personal. Well, Tex Avery <laughs> was the not only was he the, he the master of the broad take. And, and totally, completely off the wall surreal animation, but his timing was oh, yeah, impeccable. Of course, of course, yeah. That's uh, <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't laugh. <laughs> and but, oftentimes, you know, he'd do something. There'd be a gag, and you think that's the end of it, and then there'd be one more little topper on the yeah, top of right. the gag. Yeah, he and he did stuff, and that that um, that. See, the thing is, the reason why watching that documentary blew my mind is because I didn't know. I hadn't seen any of his shorts, or if I had, they'd been obscured. Because usually, what you who you tend to notice most of all is Chris Freely, Chuck Jones, and maybe Bob Clampett. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I say maybe because some people don't even know mm -hmm. Bob Clampett. Those are those are the three big directors that everybody takes note of when you watch shorts, and those are the ones that keep getting rerun. When you when you see shorts, those well, they for whatever reason they didn't rerun. Disney didn't rerun their shorts for a long time on television the way the Warner Brothers did. Yeah. So, um, but you never really see Tex Avery stuff, and I guess it's partly because he wasn't. He was part of the MGM stuff. His stuff is more MGM. So because Warner Brothers, he was early Warner Brothers, but they tend to run the later Warner Brothers cartoons. And then when he moved to MGM, you don't get to see Droopy shorts very often or at all it used to be now now they've had had them on cartoon uh, on the cartoon network channel oh, okay. and stuff. yeah <clears throat> so you didn't actually see yeah. his work and 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 so I, at least when I was growing up all I saw all I was aware of was the later Warner Brothers stuff 
And so when I saw this documentary, it opened my eyes to a different style of shorts. And, and the way that he messed with, with people's heads as far as the film... Like there was a gag in one of the one of his shorts where the the one of the, there's a dog and he's sitting he's singing opera, and there's a hair on the film and it's flipping around. My, what is it, Maestro? What's the Man. magical Maestro? I think. Yeah, it's magical ma- yeah. Maestro. That's hilarious. And uh, yeah, and he's singing and he's singing and there's a hair in the film, and it's just all it's, it's caught in the film gate. It's, ca- it's caught it, it, ca- yeah. in the film gate and throughout yeah. throughout throughout the the. The short, it just kind of appears and disappears and appears and disappears, and finally the character just picks it up and tosses it out. Plucks it out. Plucks it out. He breaks the fourth wall. <laughs> right. You know, it's funny. We did the same thing at, in uh, Mickey's uh, at Disneyland in Mickey's house. There's a film that plays at the beginning as you're waiting to get in and see Mickey's house, and I animated some of Goofy on that, and we did the same thing where a hair gets cut in the film gate. Right. Except it comes to life, and Goofy's trying yes, to grab I've it with his hand. Yes, I've seen that. I animated that. that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you see, didn't know that, did you? No. <laughs> but see, but that's that's the thing. Like, So he, he, he set that up. I mean, that joke doesn't read watching it on video. It would only read if you're like in the movie theater, watching an old, uh, in an old film projector where that sort of thing happens. Right. Um, and then because it did, it happened. Yeah, because it happened. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember going to the movies and seeing hair. Well, I'd heard that people stopped the film, and tried to fix it, and realized it was on the film itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I, it's just it, it's brilliant. And then he he did a lot of that stuff because there was there's a scene, in a. Um, a Screwy Squirrel um, short where Screwy's running away from two dog dogs who are hunting him and they run so far uh, off, uh, off off uh, off the cartoon that they've they passed the film pre- preparations so yeah they, yeah they've passed the film preparations and the soundtrack uh, yeah or and there's yeah it's that that that's one of the gags and another one of the gags is when they they run past the Technicolor line <laughs> and they walk in. and everything goes black and, and everything white. goes black and white and then they, and, they, and then they, everybody stops and they turn to look and then there's like a there's an actual sign that says Technicolor line stops here or whatever and then they look, and then they run back into the color part so I mean it's stuff like that like it's just. It's just crazy. Well, without Tex Avery, you wouldn't have ever had Roger Rabbit. At least, yeah, well, not it, in the way that it that it yeah, was made. But, but it was it was totally. It was a Tex Avery cartoon. It was a Tex Avery. It was heavily influenced by Tex Avery. Yeah, it, and that's and that's really it, it's very strange because it's that movie is a Tex Avery cartoon with live action elements in it, but it's got, but not all shorts were Tex Avery had Tex Avery gags in it. No. So, it, it, so it, it, it's it's really strange how it suddenly it's like, this is cartoons. Tex Avery's cartoons. But of course you got to consider that, you know, obviously it was influenced by other, by other cartoons as well, but uh, Tex Avery, I, I don't think most people who are in animation realize how influential he was. Yes. You know, most people don't even know yeah, your, your average layperson who's not in the film industry doesn't know that he created Bugs Bunny. Right, and uh, yeah, it's Chuck Jones, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, and you think about how he affected he affected so all he affected Warner Brothers cartoons, mm-hmm. uh, and and brought them into a, a new uh, a new uh, look and a new realm and in a and really broad animation. Uh, without Tex Avery, I don't think a, a Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote would have ever come about because. No? I think Chuck was heavily influenced by his former boss, Tex Avery. And you look at how he affected Tom and Jerry. He, he was indirectly he affected Tom and Jerry. How he oh, yeah. Indir- Absolutely. Well, that, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And then how he indirectly affected Roger Rabbit. And uh, there was a... There was a... Uh, I think there was even a time where he was affecting the uh, Disney cartoons, but, you know, they, they never went... There are exceptions, but generally they never went as broad and as wild as the Tex Avery stuff. I don't think there was anybody out there who was quite as wild, except maybe maybe Bob Clampett. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think the difference also between say somebody like Chuck Jones and Fritz Feeling 
compared to somebody like Bob Clampett and Tex Avery is that they weren't character driven shorts like Chuck Jones really kind of his were personality driven yeah they were very personality driven yeah um yeah Tex was usually all about the gag yeah it was it's just the, it's just about the jokes like the characters yeah. are just simply exist so that they're just like ridic- ridiculous crazy stuff could happen to them and that's it and they're, yeah. it's, it's, and they're just really archetypes and they don't really go beyond they're, they're not very deep characters <laughs> you, could, you, could, you could argue that Chuck Jones added some kind of depth to Bugs Bunny as opposed to Tex, Texas uh, Bugs Bunny which was like the, the egg headed Bugs Bunny who was just like he the, still looked like Bugs but but more rudimentary. Yeah, yeah, and and he was definitely more. Oh, oh, and that's another thing. Okay, so speaking of Bugs Bunny and and uh, and the Tex Avery shorts of Bugs Bunny, uh, the What's Up Doc. He invented yeah. What's Up Doc, yeah. and it and and the reason why where, where that came from was because that was just something that was, um, what was said in Tex Avery's high school. Everybody called each other Doc in in high school. So to him, it was just like saying dude. So, <laughs> like, so he obviously must have highly influenced Back to the Future. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like I'm like... Uh, <laughs> what's... what's uh, do you have a favorite Tex Avery cartoon? I, I always think uh, there's one. There's one... I can't believe I, I don't remember the name of that cartoon. What happens in it? Maybe I can remember it. It's, it's, um, it's just uh, Symphony and Slang. Oh, I love Symphony and Slang. And that's the so one. I carried on. <laughs> yes, I was beside myself with anger. And then the entire, the entire cartoon is based off of just sayings and slang. Do you know who did the character designs on that? No. Tom Oreb. And I... He did the he did the character designs for Sleeping Beauty. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> very very influential that, I, character that, designer. It's one of, one of the reasons why I like that cartoon mm-hmm. is because of its graphic quality. Mm-hmm. It's not animated almost at all. It's super super limited, but that's not the point. The point is is it, it, it's almost like a slideshow of gags because it's a story being told completely in slang. Just weird, like just sayings and things like that. But, but it's they're all visually portrayed in the most obvious ways. It, it's so. Do you want that is? Oh my god! Do you remember that part? It's uh, the the. Oh yeah, yeah. Like the, what's the matter? <laughs> cat got your tongue. Cat, cat got your tongue. <laughs> yeah, things like cat got your tongue. And, and this then, cat it, is sitting there, and suddenly he just pops into the next. To the next pose, and he goes. He's, he has his hand he's out. He's got a so, little tongue. There's a tongue in his hand. <laughs> it's stuff like that, gags like that, and the entire short is just that, and it's hilarious. That that, that by far is my favorite. Um, all the all the Red Riding Hood shorts, I love them to death, and um, and the droopy and the droopies are just incredible. Like I, I man. Hello, all you happy people. But Symphony and Slang is my favorite, but. Close, close second are 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 the um, uh, is Red Red Riding Hood with the the city dog and the country dog and they go to the <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> they go to the to the nightclub and then it's it's and then it's basically like two minutes of just the country dog the the country wolf freaking out like that's, that's all it is it's just him freaking out remember, and then chasing after uh, chasing after do you remember Red. Billy the one with the Billy Goat. Yes, yes. And, and uh, uh, oh gosh, the voice artist who did, he was Elroy. The guy who did Elroy from the Jetsons was the I don't know voice of the wolf in that. Hey, y'all, it's Billy. Oh, yeah. Hey, Billy, boy, 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 boy. I love that cartoon. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, the, those characters are, are fantastic. So, uh, yeah, if I if I if I would recommend, I'm sure I'm sure these shorts are on YouTube. I Symphony and Slag must oh, be on YouTube. Oh, they're all they're all on YouTube now. So if possible, I highly recommend um, uh, doing a YouTube search on Tex Avery. 
Um, I'm sure the, one of the first things you're going to get is the clips of that short uh, of that documentary, and on top of that, you'll probably get a bunch of Tex Avery shorts. So I'm gonna I'm gonna look up the name of that Billy Goat cartoon right now with Tex Avery. Of course, my cell service is <laughs> slow. Wouldn't you know it? Talk about something, man. You can't just leave leave, leave, leave the recording blank. <laughs> What's the matter? Let's see. Well, I'm trying cat, to think. Cat got your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. What else? Uh, I'm trying to think of, of other of other cartoons that that I've really. Yeah, I can't. I can't think of any right now. Billy he, Boy he, is the name of it. Looks oh, like. Oh, it's called yeah, Billy it's Boy. Called Billy Boy. There was a. Yeah. There was. He did a few um, cartoons that that were a lot like. Cars and planes. <laughs> the oh movies, yeah, where it was just. Oh well, those influenced cars. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. They they even had this almost the exact same design. Um, yeah. So there were there were. I don't like those so much. Like his later stuff, besides Symphony and Slang, his later stuff started not being as good. I think he just started getting tired, right? <laughs> well, he, I guess he you can only himself. do so many g- there's gags. Only, there's, you could only come up with so many gags before you basically exhausted your reserve of gags. <laughs> um, but man, like, I don't, I, very few people ever even copied those gags. They, they tend to copy a lot of the Warner's, the yeah. Warner's gags. Well, you know, I watched, I, I remember when I was animating on Swan Princess, I, there were, not every shot, but on some shots I was allowed to get really broad. So there was, there was one where uh, I was animating the Puffin on Swan Princess, and he does this wild take, and he chomps on the prince's boot. Okay. And there's a frame where he's got, like, one uh, one giant wide long eye with a long pupil, and then two, right. other, and two other eyes in the smear, and he's got, like, three tongues. And all that kind of stuff is, you know, I was influenced by the Tex Avery cartoons. And I didn't get to do those gags, even, even when I was animating Bugs Bunny and, and uh, the Looney Tunes. Only occasionally would we get to do those kinds of gags. We were never really? allowed to go that wild. I think someone, something modern that was obviously influenced by Tex Avery would be Ren and Stimpy. Oh. They were very influenced well, by, well, by I, Tex Well, actually, Avery. no. I, well, I'm t- and Bob Clampett. I think it was more Bob Clampett than that than Tex. But a lot of those takes and stuff, I don't think uh, you could separate the two. I, I'm sure that I'm sure I know that he, that uh, uh, John Kay says, talks about how influenced he is by Bob Clampett. But obviously, Tex Avery was a big influence too, simply because of the the kind of gags that Tex did. Some of those would end up in in uh, Ren in Ren and Stimpy cartoons, visually. Some of the vi- some of the visual gags. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, man. Dawes <laughs> Butler was the voice of the wolf in, uh, in, in, in that Billy Boy. And he, he was the voice of the wolf in several of the Droopy cartoons. Not all of them. Right. But several of them. Yeah, because he didn't have, like I said, he didn't have, like, a char- he wasn't a character. He was uh, an archetype, and he had to, like, be whatever right. the, the guy. He eventually was. became a, a character, but at first... At first, he had a voice that was almost like this, and the, you know, the wolf was like this. And then later on, it became it, Dawes Butler took over and, and did that voice. And then Dawes went on to do many, many commercial voices. I think he was Quisp and Quake, and, and he, he did uh, uh, Elroy, and he was um, many of the uh, early Hanna-Barbera characters, like Yogi Bear and and uh, those types. But he started doing voices uh, early on back in the MGM days. I met his, his son years ago at Ray's, when Ray Patterson passed okay. away at his funeral. Okay. Well, one, one more thing. I just, I just, uh, I just remembered uh, and forgot. So I guess... <laughs> Boy, that was incredible. People are sitting at their computers even now. <laughs> Hovering, the finger hovering over the the, the pause button. <laughs> what did it have to do with? Tech Avery? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so has he influenced anything that you've done when you've been at while you've been at the Simpsons? 
man, I wish I could say yes, but no. I mean, it's like we're, allowed, we're, right? we're not allowed to, <laughs> to, to go there. <laughs> What's the wildest take that you've ever done or wildest animation you've ever done in the sense that you can think of off the top of your head? Before they put the clamps down, said no more of that. Gosh, you know, oh man. I mean, there, there's just a couple of screams, yeah. things mm-hmm. like that. Uh, I, I've done well. Itchy and scratchy. You're allowed to at least go, go there to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, so I did animate some itchy and scratchy stuff. Uh, I mean, I was. Uh, I, I did a scene. Did you ever I, animate a Bart in the take where his jaw goes one way and his head goes the other? Never. That was that was oh, out man. after the first season, I think. <laughs> um. There was a, I mean, I did do a scene where I got to chop off Quentin Tarantino's head off. And I, What's that got to do with Tex Avery? <laughs> the violence. It's wow. a, It's a Tex Avery, it was, it was an itchy and scratchy. <laughs> it was an itchy and scratchy where Tar- uh, Quentin Tarantino's head got chopped off. Excellent. And uh, Itchy got to chop it off. And then, yeah, and that was, that was a lot of fun. And that was... Do you know who would have loved to talk about Tex Avery? Chance. Chance. <laughs> 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 it's too bad too bad chance <laughs> alright well I think this wraps it up for another I think, one I think it does so uh, where can they find uh, us online on well uh, you can find me online at on Facebook of Ghost Train Pictures on Facebook the Ghost Train website will be up soon as well Ghost Train Pictures on Facebook and Ghost Train Pictures Dot com, and please come and visit our cornerbooth.net site. If you've got some ideas for shows or comments on shows you listen to, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, and uh, join our newsletter so you can uh, get updated for any kind of corner booth news that might be coming up uh, forthcoming. Uh, especially if we start uh, doing more live a- live meetups or Google Hangout meetups, uh, you're probably going to want to uh, subscribe to that. Uh, newsletter, so you could at least get alerted to it. Um, you could find me on LuisEscobarBlog.com. That's my personal blog. Or you could um, go to the drawing website. Uh, yeah, the drawing website.com, where you could uh, learn to draw. Uh, you could get a free book there. Uh, you actually, you could get a free digital book on both my sites. But in the drawing website, you're going to get a free how-to draw book. And again, thanks for listening to thecornerbooth.net. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, uh, please take a listen to our other podcasts and let your friends know. Once again, this is Luis Escobar and Larry Whitaker at The The Corner Corner Booth. Booth.